Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the LibertyCon uh, Vocal Vampire Voices uh, panel. Uh, we are just kind of all fans of the, the uh, in, in, uh, pulling vampires into the genres that we write in. Uh, we've got a few cool authors here. I, I like everybody here. I have Facebook friends with them, and I've seen them at conventions. We've got Jonathan Baird, Karen Bogan, Amy Gibbons, Tamara Lowry, and, of course, Terry Maggart. And uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining me here. Uh, in our virtual Liberty Con, uh, we're just going to talk today about uh, some different uh, things. Uh, not your, I don't think it's going to be your average vampire panel. Uh, uh, we're going to toss some questions around. We're going to throw some ideas about. And but first, I'd like to let everybody introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they've had going on and uh, uh, what they've got going on as far as uh, uh, written works and and what they're doing in the industry right now. So we'll start temporarily with, uh, or we'll start with uh, Jonathan Baird. So Jonathan. Uh, let's t tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, Jonathan Baird. Um, I just finished classes for uh, my PhD uh, in American history, so I'm ABD right now. Uh, I'm teaching at uh, UNC uh, Greensboro. Um, I wrote when I when when I, I have several master's degrees. I have master's degrees in history and English. When I did my English master's degree, I wrote uh, part of this book, which is called Wolf in Petticoats. And it's about uh, gothic horror and it's uh, the influence of Darwin, sexuality and gender on gothic horror in the uh, late 19th century. So um, I think that's why I'm on this panel, because I, I know about, quite a bit about Victorian vampires. Um, I know more about werewolves, hence the name of Wolf in Petticoats. But um, I've never written anything about vampires. Um, two years ago, literary wise, two years ago, I had a comic book in the top 10 in the in Amazon in overall comics, uh, which beat out every Marvel title, which I was amazed. Uh, <laughs> uh, since then, I have been working on my PhD, so I haven't written much in the literary sense. Very cool. Uh, Karen Bogan, I'm just going, by the way, you guys, I'm just going in the order of my screen. So uh, Karen Bogan, let's hear a little bit about you. Ah, oh, well, I don't actually write vampire novels, but occasionally vampires do make an appearance in my books, uh, particularly the most recent one I wrote, which, blatant plug, I'm going to bring it up here. Uh, Dracula himself makes an appearance in that book. Uh, but I've always been a fan of vampires for a long, long, long time, and I, uh, I guess I'm here as the token historian because... I don't really read any of the new stuff. I mostly read the, I, I read old stuff and I watch old movies. Um, so if you if you like the old, you know, Frank Langella, Louis Chardin, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee stuff, I'm your person. If you want sparkly vampires, I'm not it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, and I realize that Twilight is a real big thing with a lot of people, but one of my favorite pictures is a picture of Ripley from the Aliens movie and the alien like right here, and then the mem is still a better love story than Twilight. <laughs> Again, not I did meaning to offend anybody, but I just I just think that mem's hilarious. I did buy five copies of it, but it's because people were requesting them. I was in Paris that year. So I bought five copies in French for these kids who were asking for them. Very cool. Very cool. All right, uh, Tamara Lowry. Yes. Your turn. All right. I am the author of the Ways of Darkness series, which is currently out of publication, but I am in the process of uh, revisions and re-edits on Blood Curse, the first book in the series, to release the second edition of it, uh, hopefully later this year, self-published. I broke up with my original publisher back in 2018, and this will also be the 10th anniversary of the original publication. And if you like pirates that aren't nice and vampires that don't oh. sparkle, uh, these are the books for you. <laughs> I th I'm sensing a theme here about the vampires not sparkling. Uh, Amy, go ahead, take your shot. All right, hi y'all, I'm Amy Gibbons. Uh, with the whole vampire sparkling thing, I don't do that, but I'm probably the closest author to that here. I do paranormal romance. So as you can see, my lovely books are behind me. My main series is the uh, Psychic Undercover series where the uh, main character is... Sorry, you have a ghost. I have a ghost. <laughs> 
a ghost that is my wife that keeps walking in going, what are you doing? I'm not talking <laughs> at LibertyCon, baby. So. Okay, sorry, I got distracted. Um, so, yeah, mine are a lot more of the, these are not appropriate for under 18. There are sex scenes. They're those kind of vampire novels. But again, mine don't sparkle. And mine definitely have a ruthless side. See, awesome. Uh, I, my name's Tom Kenny. Uh, I've written uh, space opera, sci-fi, fantasy. I, I, like, I, like, I like using vampires in my urban fantasy shorts. What I did was I wrote a book with my son called Blood of Nvidia. It was a Dragon Award finalist, which we're very happy since it was our first book together. Uh, him and I wrote the book in the cloud, having never physically met in person. I didn't find out about it until he was 18. But we wrote the book, and the book was reasonably successful. We're pretty happy with that. And we were able to use the royalties so we could actually fly out and meet each other um, for the first time. And that was very cool. There's actually a video online you can see called, I think it's Author, Father Meets Son for First Time. Anyway, it's on YouTube. It's on my channel. But uh, our take is we, we kind of played with the vampires, uh, vampires, werewolves, supernatural creatures as rather than uh, magical as alien species. So we kind of attacked it from that or brought that kind of element to it. So less magic, more technology. But it was a really fun, fun thing to write about. So uh, very cool. Uh, I think our other participant, Terry, has dropped away. He was having some signal issues. Uh, if he rejoins us, that would be very cool. Uh, but we're going to keep going, going ahead. So. I wrote down some basically some uh, some ticklers for for conversational uh, pieces, and we're just everybody can kind of throw in they want to. Uh, if I start to the left, it's on my screen. It's just Jonathan, but we'll try to rotate a little bit. So uh, everybody here, what are your favorite types of vampires? Meaning, either classic, urban fantasy. Uh, you know, what sort of vampires make you uh, happy to watch? Uh, we'll start with Jonathan, or watch. Sorry, watch read. Uh, what, what vampires excite you, Jonathan? I think my favorite vampire uh, archetype trope is the reluctant vampire. Barnabas Collins comes to mind as probably my favorite vampire in either literature or, or you know, in um, media of any kind. I think he he, yeah, but he's very close to. If you read, if you've ever read Varney the Vampire, that came out in 1847, I think. Barnabas Collins is very similar to that vampire uh, it's he he has a lot of the same tropes uh, other than the fact he can't come out during the day uh, Varney the vampire could is before the uh, vampires not being able to come out in the day but Barnabas is probably my favorite and the, the reluctant vampire obviously he was trying to cure his vampirism throughout his run on uh, dark shadows I, I used to come home from school, and that was one of the series. And, of course, it was I think it was just about in reruns about the time I saw it. It might have been at the tail end of the regular series because that was a daytime soap. Yeah. I mean, it was, such a, it was such a crazy thing to, to, to watch. But, yeah, I, 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 I agree. That was, that's an awesome character. Now, uh, Karen, oh. are you uh, – oh, sorry, uh, John Lee? Uh, I was just going to say uh, the original vampires, both Varney and Dracula – well, they're not the first, but the original popularized vampires – were daytime or are a lot like daytime soaps because they were serialized. Varney was six hundred and sixty-seven thousand words. Wow, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it's a serial over many years uh, in Penny Dreadfuls. So, oh, uh, Karen, I mean, classic vampires, urban fantasy vampires, kind of. What, what's your take on it? What's your fave? I, I tend to go with the more classic vampires. Um, Probably my favorite one, my favorite Dracula was the uh, BBC production of uh, Dracula with Louis Jourdain, where he's played as a sympathetic character. I'm also very, very fond of uh, Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough's St. Germain, which probably because I also like history and she kept setting him in all kinds of historical settings. But yes, I was also a fan of Barnabas Collins when I was in elementary school, we had this network of kids that at any given, on any given day during the week, somebody could manage to stay home from school sick. And by quarter after getting home, everybody knew what happened that day. We were that good. <laughs> now, so, um, uh, and, and we'll get to you in just a second, Tamara. What, what about the, the Lestat sort of interview with the vampire vampire? I mean, it had a lot of historical stuff in it. It was, it was romanticized quite a bit, of course. But did, did that, does that have any appeal to you, Karen? Anne Rice is not one of my favorites. I, 
Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Just <laughs> never really cared that much for her. Wow. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so many to choose from. Oh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, and and and, and uh, sometimes a writing style, as you read it, uh, even the movie was okay, but uh, I I'm just not a, a big into her book kind of guy. But yeah, just that fact that 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 vampire is out now, there. I did go see I did go see uh, Interview with the Vampire, and everybody was complaining that Tom Cruise couldn't pull it off, and I said, give the guy a chance, and he did a good job. But it, I still don't read it. I'm going to be on for an hour. Hey, what about you, Tamara? Uh, I kind of like a mix. I mean, I've read the original Dracula probably three times. I don't own a copy anymore, but I was very into it as a teenager. Uh, but I also like some of the more modern takes on it. Uh, one of my guilty pleasures is Laurel K. Hamilton, her Anita Blake Vampire Hunter series. I actually got a lot of my writing chops started by doing fanfic of hers. Ooh, Back wow. in the early 2000s. So, I have so never rumors, had the pleasure of reading her stuff because I bought them and my son wandered off with them and I never saw them again. So, so the internet rumor is that um, Fifty Shades of Grey was originally fanfic from Twilight and yeah. the gal that wrote it said, hey, can I, you know, use this and I, you know, I'd like to follow up and blah. And, and the, basically the author said No. So she pulled the vampire aspects out and just turned it into a BDSM, you know, mommy porn kind of book. Of course, she made more money than all of us, you know, combined. So, I mean, good move on her part. But uh, I I'd heard that. Have those, uh, those of you heard that? Yes. <laughs> okay. Don't know if it's true, but it's out there. So, Amy, favorite types of vampires? Uh, so I tend to like the more urban fantasy vampires. I like the idea of vampires as... They're still human beings. They still have souls and conscience, but you basically get to take human nature and take it to the extreme because vampires, there's a little bit more forgiveness in that. So the ones I like are like Laurel K. Hamilton. Um, I think that was the first real urban fantasy series I discovered, and I loved them for the first 10 books. But hey. Um, no, is, is and then the, like stuff who, like um, Tim Harrison. Charlene Harris, and then like for TV shows, I really like Vampire Diaries. I didn't watch it when it was on, and it, they put it on Netflix, and I was bored last year because who wasn't? And I watched it. And I'm like, this is awesome because they take all of these human, human nature, and they go. So this character is going to go to the extreme because they can, and I love that exploration of being able to do that. But, uh, now the Suki Suki Stackhouse, who wrote those? Uh, Charlene, Charlene Harris. Harris. Yeah, okay. So we would watch True Blood for a while, but then I got tired of looking at, you know, naked bodies and, and the plots got kind of kind of lame. Although my favorite character is uh, Eric because he's just generally a badass. And let's be real, he's a Viking vampire. So you, you can't lose with that combination. Oh, and the, yeah. the, his gal, gal pal, his, uh, the, the gal he turned her, she's, what was her name? Ham? Yeah. Oh my God. She is just, she's awesome, and, and her lines are so deadpan, so she, <laughs> she actually makes the show, for me, she makes the show. Yeah, um, the, the books were better, but I am with you on Vikings being awesome. My um, boyfriend is actually, like, Swedish, descended from the Vikings, and so I'm just like, yes, I can totally speak to Vikings being awesome. I, I spent a, a year in Iceland on assignment, and uh, those guys are the original Vikings. There's, like, a statue of Leif Erikson in the middle of Reykjavik. Uh, fun crowd, fun people to be around. Um, for me, the, the I like the classic vampires. Of course, the, the early the early movies, the Belly Lugosi, uh, Christopher Lee. We talked about earlier, kind of uh, before the meeting started. Uh, that that stuff's always good for a scare. But my favorite vampires are like the Blade slash Underworld type vampires. The uh, urban fantasy to a point, but I just like them dropped into a modern setting. And just kind of having to deal with the modern world, and, and then exploiting their uh, their long life and their their needs in the modern world, and either succeeding or failing based on that. Uh, and that's actually uh, in in our book. That's why we went with aliens as vampires instead uh, of the the paranormal take. I also like the way that um, uh, Larry uh, Korea writes Korea. 
I, I, I pronounce it Korea. He says Korea. You know, he should just learn from me. It's Korea. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but his take on vampires with the, the kind of the levels of, of uh, uh, strength built over time, the, the older the vampire, of course, the more powerful, that sort of stuff always, <laughs> has always appealed to me uh, as well. And I, and I also like the Bram Stoker's version, uh, mostly because uh, the actor Gary, oh my gosh. Uh, Oldman. Scary Gary. Gary. Yeah, Gary, Gary Oldman is one of the, the best role players out there. I love everything he does because he becomes that person. And as Dracula, he was he was pretty, pretty darn cool. So, yeah, yeah, very cool. Anybody want to close out with a comment on that general classic versus urban fantasy? All right. So the next thing I'm going to move on to is I'm going to talk a little or ask you guys about. So typically the vampire uh, in most of these instances or sorry, in a lot of instances has uh, someone that acts as a, a familiar or an enabler, a human being without the vampire uh, take that, that actually helps them along uh, in, in the case of the daytime support or in the uh, finding the next uh, meal um, or that sort of thing. So in, in your take, when, you, when we think about the, the, the Renfields of the world, do you have a, a favorite character? Do you think they're necessary? Do, do you think they, they play into the vampire story? as relevant, uh, bringing that human part to the story. And uh, we'll start with Karen. Do you, what do you think of vampire familiars, not animal familiars, but as, as people? Um, I think that sometimes they're necessary. And I suspect that as vampires move into the digital age, they're, they're very necessary because somebody's got to go out there and make sure they've got all the right documentation. And so, you know, finding yourself a good computer hacker to go in and make sure that you leave a digital trail would be a good thing. Um, so yeah, they're they're necessary. They're not necessarily likable. Um, some of them are very unlikable, like the Renfield version in playing off of George Hamilton. Sorry, I'm not not naming names. Sorry, you'll have to name them yourself. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, it's a necessary evil. I so, think. Uh, Tamara, what do you think about the, the, the Renfield or the, the enabler character that tends to support vampires in a story? Um, I, I do see them as necessary for the traditional vampires. Um, more more urban fantasy vampires uh they might not necessarily be as needed i think it's spread out more with usually it's spread out more in the ones that that i've seen as uh almost like a fan base instead the, 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 of a the, single the, the wannabe show. vampires that want to be turned that that hang around the the vampire think waiting for their yeah. turn but at, yeah. at their beck and call kind of guy. Again, still an enabler, but uh, maybe a multiple personality or multiple people versus the singular Renfield sort of character. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, uh, Amy. Okay, so I hate the Renfield thing. I hate the trope. It drives me nuts. It's too easy. Yeah. And oh yeah, you need like you can't go out in the sunlight in this reality of vampires. It's okay, just go be with your human. They'll do your bidding. And I'm just going, wow, that's a cop out. Uh, I really like the whole enablers thing where you have humans who are like, oh, I'm trying to help my friend, or I'm trying to you know make sure my boyfriend stays alive. The more human type of enabling that you would see in everyday life, like if you have a vampire that you know, maybe has a little bit of a problem with blood where they drink too much and you're trying to get them to calm down. It's basically like you try to deal with an alcoholic. And to me, that's a lot more approachable. Renfields bug me. They bug me. They get under my skin in a way I cannot quite, quite explain, but I hate it. <laughs> awesome. Jonathan, what's your, you've got more of a historical perspective here. The, the, well, the supporting role, this, the vampire enabler, what do you think? Well, you know, the Renfield, Renfield and, and all these vampire enablers are basically exposition characters. They, they sort of explain the modern world to the vampire that may have been uh, not in that modern world. I, I think uh, 
besides Renfield, I think of, you know, we could go back to uh, Dark Shadows. Ju- Dr. Julia Huffman, I had to look up her name because I, I knew Julia, but I couldn't remember her full name. Uh, she explains, you know, medical science to Barnabas and, 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 you know, within that show. And then I was thinking about what we do in the shadows. I don't know if anyone here has watched that show, but um, I cannot remember the character's name. I tried to look it up really quick. He uh, is so... He oh is my one of he, my favorite Redfield type characters of all time. Because he and wants to be a... He's, he's a Van Helsing, uh, too, so that's yes. hilarious. And that is... He, being a, a Van Helsing and a Redfield makes his character... It, it, is a, it is a really unique take on that, on that type of character. And I just love it. I mean, that, that oh. show is so well-written. The wet, the best Renfield ever done was Cleveland Little in Once Bitten. <laughs> okay, I remember seeing that years ago. I probably need to watch that again. Well, yeah, with Jim Carrey as the potential victim. <laughs> so, I mean, so, uh, he probably wishes that he could forget. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jonathan actually touched on a pretty cool uh, thing I hadn't thought about for the, kind of the standard trope, which is the uh, historically long uh, um, uh, vampire hunter, the, the, either by, by a family or organization. These guys are dedicated to going after the, the vampires, but they always seem to miss. So um, well, let's, let's talk about the, the people and organizations that, that are chasing the vampires and what you think the kind of the, the playoff is. Why do they fail, and uh, are they necessary to the story outside of the regular arc? So, Amy, what do you, what do you think about you know? So, you know, we, we've got uh, Van Helsing and his daughter and his granddaughter uh, chasing after the vampire, uh, but uh, but always not quite getting the big guy. Uh, you know, is, is that does that add to the story? Does that detract from the story? Does it have something uh, the hero we could relate to versus the anti hero anti hero that we're reading about? Uh, I honestly think that adds a lot to a story because you have um, an antagonist. Now, from my pr- point of view, usually the vampire is the protagonist or aligned with the protagonist because that's the type of stuff I write. But um, either way you write it, even if they're not the good guy, they can still be the protagonist in the book. If they have an enemy that is driven, smart, trained, it makes it a lot more of a uh, real conflict and especially if you look at it from the human point of view where they're going vampires are bad they kill people it is our duty to stop them you can't really argue with people who are going like yeah i'd do that too like they they killed your sister i'd become a vampire hunter too like i'm with you i really like that because then you can relate to both sides they're they're both like you're going oh crap I like I get where they're coming from they're not a black and white bad guy or like the vampire you know is like this and they have issues and they're basically a human with some superpowers and and issues I get why they did it and it was an accident or it was an overreaction but now it's pretty much like head and head somebody's got to take somebody out and you really don't know who to root for. <laughs> Exactly. I, I love and, that in the story. I think it makes it more complex really, and more real. It really doesn't help the vampire hunters much that the vampires are so freaking hard to kill. You kind of yeah. have to well, be a real hard to get one. It depends on the reality's rules. Some of them are harder to kill than others. True. So, and one of the other things I think, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to Tamara now, so we're going to talk about the, the, the Van Helsing slash Van, vampire hunter um, the vampire hunter obviously knows, or over a period of time, uh, he's not. They're not an amateur. They 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 understand the weaknesses of the vampire, but they never seem to quite. Uh, again, realizing the different arcs, they never seem to quite get there. The vampire always has one wily sneak away. Uh, oh, you know, the vampire hunter got there too late, and it's just about sundown, and aha, he's he's safe again. He's he's at all uh, his high strength. So, Tamara, what do you think about the vampire hunter? That, that doesn't quite succeed and perpetuates the story, or your, your opinion in general about the, the Van Helsing-style vampire hunter in a story. Does it help? Does it hurt? Uh, well, I've used it, but uh, I've got, it's kind of a convoluted um, 
subplot that goes throughout all seven books. And I've actually got my main vampire hunter related to one of the vampires. Oh. And and also being used by other vampires to weed out the weak that and the uh, stupid vampires that draw too much attention to their kind. <laughs> awesome! Very cool. Um, I, I I'm gonna hop in here really quick in our story, uh, the one that my son and I wrote. Um, we uh, the vampire hunters in our case are the gray aliens who've been hunting for the vampires to exterminate them across the galaxy. Uh, they were too good at their job. They didn't get the piece of, of knowledge that they wanted from the vampire race. So they've localized one to Earth. So they're the vampire hunters with literally thousands of years of information and can't seem to find this one vampire that they're looking for. Uh, so anyways, yeah, the, uh, a Renfield-esque character, but more of an overall race with a, a mission uh, to, to find this one vampire. Jonathan, what do you think of the... the uh, uh, well, vampire hunter. When you look at when because Dracula really introduces the vampire hunter in Helsing, um, and there are vampire esque hunters earlier, but Helsing is the you know the the trope that we think of. In you have to look at the time in which that uh, Dracula was written. We're on the the we're at the end of the nineteenth century. Uh, Dracula Dracula was published in eighteen ninety seven. Uh, it had been in the in the you know, pub, it had been published you know, within the Strand magazine for a few years before that. But what what Bram Stoker is looking at is, um, if you look at Dracula, it's about science. The Helsing uh, uses utilizes science to try to, to destroy the vampire throughout the throughout the novel, and it's a it's really the story is really a who is more power what is more powerful is is magic and and evil and the devil more powerful than science and always the the supernatural always sneaks away in the end because you can never fight you can never conquer the supernatural with science and that's really what the the, the central thesis of the book is about and in, of course in my book i write about you know how the science you know how darwin had changed you know the scientific thinking of the late 19th century and this is one of those aspects in which you know, the vampire is quintessentially supernatural. Helsing is quintessentially scientific. And it's these two things that are butting up against each other. Wow. Very cool. Yes, great perspective. Um, so uh, now let's move on to, uh, we, we've talked a lot about Dracula. We've talked a lot about a lot of other main characters, which tend to be male. Uh, but there are powerful female vampires that, that get written about and brought in. Um, so, and I actually read a, a series of books called, uh, the, the Dampier series, D-H-A-M-P-I-R. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but I enjoyed the series. Um, uh, it was about a female half vampire that was a vampire killer, but also she had to succumb to her basic needs of, of feeding. So if, if we kind of flip this on his head, does a, a female vampire have the same, uh, sort of, uh, Renfield characters, uh, Van Helsing character, is, is she more, is she likely to get away with it? Is there, is there some sympathy for the female character? Is she more sexualized than the male character? Although, you know, again, the, the trope is vampires are, male vampires are always sexy. I, I'm just waiting for some troll guy to become a vampire and people go, damn, he's ugly. Don't bite me. But, <laughs> so, but so when, when a woman, when we have a main character, a, a vampirella sort of uh, character, th does that, uh, is that a possibility? Is that, is that interesting? Uh, does, does it can it have the same tropes as a male vampire character? And I'm going to start with Amy. Oh, okay. See, I like this subject. Um, so I would say, first of all, yes, they can have the same tropes. Where you really have fun with it is when you go, okay, we recognize the fundamental differences between um, women and men in the Western culture. And that's what I'm talking about because that's what I know. Um, so you can say, oh yeah, there's the same tropes. Like they're sexy, of course they are. They seduce people, they hurt people, they're a little sadistic. You can do all that, but it's then you get to throw in every Mel's on the panel. I am so sorry, I'm about ready to insult you. Guys are so stupid when it comes to hot women. So then you get to throw in this woman is like she's horrible and she's doing shit. And you've got but guys who are just like she's hot. She's hot. You have guys who are just like <laughs> 
but I'm gonna do this anyway. I'm gonna help her out because she's hot. Whatever. Hey, if she yeah. wants to kill me, what a way to go. Like you get a little bit more of that, I think, when you have a female vampire. Don't get me wrong, women are stupid too. Um, so we'll be like, oh yes, hot, hot male vampire, please bite me. But I, a lot of times I think it's a little bit easier to play with um, the the whole sexy female powerful and guys are just like we are the worker bees around the queen please do whatever you want with us because we will go out happy and that's like it's a lot of more it's a lot of fun to play with yeah i i i i kind of agree with that trope uh, and, and it's true in most books and, and of course i mean it maybe have been beaten to death but it's just true the 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 attractive woman in a position where she wants something, the guy that wants her is going to, to try to achieve that. And if achieving that means that she has to suck the blood out of his body, he's going to be like, okay. <laughs> I'm okay with it. You're so hot. Go ahead. Uh, Amy, what, or sorry, Tamara, what do you think about the female vampire and sort of the power she has and her possibilities? Uh, can she succeed where the male vampires succeed? And, or does it detract from the story because her basic sexuality is always there? Who was that directed at? Uh, Tamara. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Well, yes, def definitely uh, the, the females are very successful, at least against males. Not so much against other women because we are territorial creatures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, Get um, your fans out of my boyfriend. He's mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they, they are interesting to play off each other. Worse yet would it be, Bob, why'd you let her bite her, bite you? Are, is that the kind of woman you want, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Tammy. Tamara, I'm sorry. Guys, that's, that's fine. No, but... Um, I've, I've always held that the females, the deadlier of the speech species in just about every species on the planet. The female is more deadly than the male. We, ha we have more to fight for, more to lose. Yeah. And higher stakes. Exactly. Uh, so, Jonathan, so what do you think? If I jump in right here, I don't want yeah, to quite ahead. interrupt, but I do want to build on that. Sure. Go ahead. Another reason females are deadlier is because in general across many species the females tend to be smaller so guys don't have to be deadly to defend themselves to duke it out and see who's dominant women do because we can't just like throw a punch and lay the guy out we're more of like either we don't fight or i shoot you yeah like, we, we make sure they don't get back up <laughs> yeah and i think I, I think that's one of the reasons that like underworld and a few of the other vampire things appeal to me um, I, I don't ever buy the the 120 pound woman throwing I'm six foot three throwing the six foot three guy around like oh wow look she's she's magically more powerful than him no he could crush her however when you add vampiric strength this supernatural ability or that because she's a vampire she has this power then as you're watching her reading you're like okay she could kick his ass because she she's got this elevated strength this elevated cunning this elevated speed and then she definitely wants to kick his ass. So I, I think that that plays into it when you talk about supercharging a female character and giving her the, the strength, agility, and power of a, of a full-grown, powerful... I mean, let's, be face, let's, let's face it, you, you throw a, a football player-sized bodyguard-ish against a smaller woman that suddenly is a vampire, she's lighting them up like a Christmas tree. So, Jonathan, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, we can, we, we can look at, back at the... Uh, original Dracula again and see the, the female vampires within that novel. Uh, now, Jonathan, now clarify, th those, those females were ones that he had turned and they were still kind of under his power, correct? They were under his power. It was, it was, they were, they, and they could, they, uh, in, within that novel, they had more shape changing ability. I mean, obviously Dracula could change it to a wolf as well and a, and a bat, but they could change it to me into a wolf. Uh, they were easily dispatched. <laughs> Let's just say that that in, in Dracula they did not last very long. Um, but I think that ha that has something to do with the time period it was written in, and that Jonathan Hart you know, he was supposed to be this you know somewhat he he's definitely not pure, uh, but he is he is this this 
picture of English, you know, he is an Englishman and he has to overcome these female wiles, although he is very, very, very tempted by them. Um, I, I think a better, I mean, it's not a, it's a werewolf, not a vampire, but if, if you want to look at Victorian examples of the strong woman, uh, supernatural strong woman trope, it's, it's in the, the werewolf by Clemens Houseman which is a, a book about a female werewolf, which seduces men. Um, that, uh, I mean, I don't think there, there's a better Victorian example because Victorians didn't... Uh, what, one more time, Jonathan, the title of that was what? The Werewolf by Clements Hausman. She's a female uh, feminist writer in the late Victorian era. Um, well, and, and that book is, you know, Reading that, that, that shows you the, another side of the supernatural, you know, creature trope. Uh, I, I can't think of a female vampire that was powerful until, you know, the, you know the, maybe the 80s or 90s yep. in literature or fiction. Because um, even, even, you know, earlier in the 60s and 70s, if you watch the the Hammer films, all the female vampires are subservient to, you know, the male Dracula or whichever vampire it is at the time. Yeah, I mean, uh, my first first memory of a, of a strong, I mean, just a, a over the top was, like I said, Underworld uh, from, a, from a movie perspective. Uh, she dropped onto the scene and she was independent and she just could, she didn't need anybody. She could do her thing. And that was, that was it was appealing. Uh, I think that they, they kind of, maybe blew it a little bit when she was too squishy about her love interest and what he meant to her. So, uh, but in general, uh, if he was eliminated from the story, she'd still be knocking down buildings and causing basically anything short of an atomic war. So I like I, that. That's cool. I think the, the genre did not come into its own with, with strong female characters until, you know, very late. This is a genre that, that is a male dominated male dominating you know, filled with a central male character that dominates female. And, and really, that that is a, a very central vampire trope for, you know, a century. And I'll, I'll call, park it back to uh, Larry Correa's Monster Hunter, uh, where the one of the, Julie's mom is a vampire, uh, and actually, af, after she gains her independence, she's just a bitch. But she's awesome at it, because w the way she shapes the world around her suddenly... She has all this power, and she's definitely in control, and she's definitely got an agenda. Uh, but and, and that's a like that's a, that's a likable evil character, uh, and uh, he writes her well. So very cool. Yeah. I just thought of a uh, well, I, hold on. I, I just thought of a female vampire in science fiction that uh, we don't think of a lot. The salt vampire in uh, the original series of Star Trek is definitely a female, yeah. uh, and even a strong sensual female vampire in a lot of ways and her, her husband serves as her uh, renfield i mean he's he knows what she is and he's still willing to set the trap for her to feed yes absolutely so that might be one of the earlier examples of strong female vampires so i do uh, want to jump yeah. in here and hurry ahead, ask ahead, because jonathan was saying that's like this genre has definitely been um, male dominated i'm coming from a very different time perspective of you know everything within the past 20 to 30 years as far as i can tell has been very very female dominant so i was kind of wondering when you're saying the genre has been male dominated what time period are you looking at well i'm I, looking I at the last, last hundred years not yeah, not the last oh, I, think, <laughs> I think i think john is uh, john's uh, point is true uh up and through probably through the 90s uh, there was always a playoff on the female male. There was a strong male, female, and, or there was a partnership. I think that the individual strong female character in movies specifically, but maybe in, in books, didn't start coming up into her own until there was kind of a, a, a revelation or an acceptance of, hey, this powerful being can be a woman and she doesn't require a man and doesn't require this other vampire. So as an example, the female vampire is all independent, but she was turned by a male who still has dominance over her or some sort. That that still was a theme that, that rode through it. There was never the the rising of the singular female vampire. And I don't want this to turn into a big feminism discussion. Um, yeah. But it's yeah, yeah. But, I, but I, and, I, and, and I think I think in, in backing into it, 
and, and especially specifically with stuff you cover um, in the paranormal, the, the powerful female vampire can stand independently. Uh, and, and I think this probably c- comes out of that, that particular genre in, into the, the I'm going to say the mainstream urban fantasy type thing where we say we have this strong female character. It's OK for her to be there. It doesn't require her to be turned by a, a male vampire. She doesn't have to be some servient to that vampire. And in, in light of that, she also has males around her who uh, uh, are there to make her happy. <laughs> yeah, but there are a lot of things they're overlooking. Just because you were a strong female character doesn't mean you don't need anyone. I mean, think about it. A woman who can't look at her reflection in a mirror, she's got to do something. I mean, women are basically vain. Let's think about this. I'm going to jump on on Once Bitten again. I mean, the the Renfield character, played by Cleveland Little, isn't just her step and fetch it. He's her valet, her her dresser, her, her makeup artist. Yeah, she, I got this. Yeah, mirror. I remember that. Yep. And if you can't see your reflection in a mirror and you don't want to look like death warmed over, <laughs> you have to what have someone help you. Well, yeah, that's but again, that's, awesome. that's only in the specific reality where they can't see their reflections because plenty of realities have it so they can. And also, vampires generally just look good. That's like part of one of the tropes is usually they just, they roll out of bed, they look good. Not in Dracula. The original <laughs> Dracula? Uh-uh. I wasn't talking about the original Dracula. I'm talking about urban fantasy now. Maybe the latest ones, but in the original one? Uh-uh. So, so let, me, let me throw this. Uh, we'll go on to another question here. So... One of the common tropes among vampires is because of their level in the supernatural world, when we talk about supernatural stuff, is they have dominion uh, over, there's a, in, in the hierarchy, they have dominion over the other creatures. So the, 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 that they can control a, va- a werewolf that they, you know, because of our, our mind power. Um, or other supernatural creatures are either fear them, avoid them, or they, again, they have dominion over. And this trope kind of plays on, on a regular basis in, in a lot of stories. Um, so do we think that that plays well? Do we think that we're starting to move away from that? Or are the vampires still the heap or the top of the heap when it comes to the supernatural creature, creatures? And we'll start with Tamara. Oh, boy. Um, personally, I've been steering away from that. There, I've, I've got them on an even footing with some of the other supernatural creatures that I've included. Now, I haven't done werewolves, but... I have done sirens, and actually, that is that is one of the um, my my sirens are kind of like a version of a mermaid, only not <laughs> mermaids are actually their favorite food. But um, but sirens' blood is one of the one of the unique weaknesses that I gave my vampires is that it will kill them instantly and reduce their corpse to whatever state of decay it would have reached had it died naturally instead of being turned. Cool. Jonathan, what do you, what do you think? Um, looking at, you know, vampires today, they're, they're quite different. Um, Varney and Dracula are two of the first vampires that have consciousness. Uh, before this, the, 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 idea of a vampire was a lot closer to what we have of a zombie, uh, an unthinking revenant that, that rises from the grave, uh, attacks its victim, and then returns to the grave at the end of the day. Um, nothing, but, nothing but seeking blood. Blood, blood. Blood, 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 blood. yes. And that's pretty much all it was. And, and after Varney and Dracula, you start to get these, these intelligent vampires. These are vampires that you can, you know, have a conversation with. What well, you're going to say. <laughs> and, and, well, and, and if we look at the the original portrayal of Dracula by Bela Lugosi, I mean, it was all about the eyes and and him interacting with the human characters. You know, he's deceiving them, but and he's luring a specific one into his track while he keeps the others at bay to to fulfill his need for blood. But again, you're like you're saying, the intelligent vampire comes to light. Yeah, and that's a late nineteenth century, you know, uh, a grow outgrowth of vampirism, and and we still have that today. But you can see that unintelligent. Uh, Richard Matheson, if you know anything about his work, he wrote uh, um, he wrote a book that became Omega Man and uh, The Last Man on Earth. And in that book, those are vampires, and they're the revenant, uh, low-level creatures that you know are are stalking about at night. They really 
can't have a conversation with them. They can say a few words. Uh, and of course, that becomes the the uh, uh, the zombie of today. It comes directly from Richard Matheson's work. Uh, what we think of as zombies, the the brain eating zombies, are these blood seeking zombies from Richard Matheson. So the idea that the the vampire is on the pinnacle of the supernatural is a new idea. It's 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 absolutely a new idea. That's not something that would have been recognized by even probably in 19th century. In the 19th oh, really? century, pinnacle monsters would have been maybe some kind of Egyptian creature. Um, if you look at the beetle, the beetle is a great one. The beetle, um, well, no, there's a book called The Beetle by Richard Marsh. <laughs> it, Sorry. It, uh, it came out the same year as Dracula and it outsold Dracula until 1912. Uh, and, and in that book, the the shape-shifting Egyptian character is is very vampiric as we would think of vampires today in that they use sexuality they used uh, you know this domination more more even more than the Dracula does he, the, this this is able to dominate any person within a, a really close area and I think the Victorians wouldn't have seen vampires at the as the top of the heat top the, of the way heat. we do the way we what do about today. you what about you, Karen? Do you think that that the the writing that's kind of evolved with the vampire and and I and I I tend to see this uh, even even in in let's say the Stucky ha- the, the Stucky uh, Stackhouse the the True Blood the vampires were at the top the werewolves were under them uh, in most writing it, the vampire can exert some sort of control that's been a theme now do you think that that plays well or do you think that that's not there? Um, I think that. It would be very uh, wrong of a vampire to think that they are at the top of the food chain. Because I'm pretty sure there's somebody, no matter how high up in the food chain you think you are, there's going to be somebody somebody above you. And because that chain's a circle, it's not just, you know, a long chain. It's, you know goes around in a circle when you die the plants get you so and, and when you live to forever short of a stake you know and I, I think that's part of it though karen is that, that the longevity of the vampire gives them uh, basically immortality uh it gives them a long-term ability to accumulate power and influence and and like i said i think that the, the a lot of writers bring that into influence over the entire dominion of an urban fantasy setting uh creature wise I don't know if that's right or wrong. That's, but I that's, think that's true. Been the natural but, but think about it: how much trouble it's going to be for a vampire in the modern world to be able to remain inconspicuous. To be, I mean, you know, you, a non we, non vampiric uh, take on that was the Highlander. So in Highlander, over a period of time, he had to keep giving his inheritances over and coming up with new personalities and birth certificates. And well, I at guess least that, you it, it, a picture of one of them. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, you could just kind of sketch the vampire in your license. Ah, oh, this is what I look like in my regular picture. Pretty funny. When vampires evolved, people ma- painted hand painted portraits. They didn't take photographs. Yep, exactly. It's almost Amy. over. Amy, what do you think? Uh, I've never really been a fan of the whole uh, supernatural hierarchy thing. Uh, a lot of stuff that I read and I tend to like is where they each have their own culture. So you have witches, you have were shifter, whatever. You have vampires, whatever else is out there in your the reality, and it's more of like they tend to compete with each other, um, or like try to overcorrect somebody else, or you know the vampires over here trying to make sure the the fairies or werewolves aren't killing too many people because then that draws attention to the supernatural and then they get killed. To me, that makes a lot more sense. And but, but in, that, in that same context, because of the 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 general um, the things we associate with the standard vampire powers and the, the the things that vampires can do, don't they tend to? Would would they in that case be the policemen? I mean, the werewolves are typically irrational, typically, uh, mm-hmm. which is our our, our coven oriented, and they're kind of in, in, into their own thing. And if they get out of line, who would be the best to take care of anybody? Pretty much vampire due to strength, speed, the, 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 their overall what we call powers. Uh, I think that they kind of could take care of everybody else 
uh, and therefore the, reflected, uh, you know, I'm the new sheriff in town, therefore they have that power again? Or do you think that that doesn't play and they really are in their separate kind of e e equal but separation of powers kind of thing? Uh, mm. So I think I may have misspoke or was not conveying the idea well. What you are basically saying is something that I can see and would make sense. What I'm saying is the other groups, like vampires can play police all they want. The other groups don't care. And they're going to gang up. They're going to take them out. They're going to evade the police. They're going to be basically their own little gangs. So even if somebody does appoint themselves ruler over supernatural and we're going to keep the peace... You've got a bunch of gangs that say, we don't follow laws, so screw you. Uh, that makes more sense to me. Pretend to follow the rules, uh, uh, defer to you, but the second you're out of sight, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. Um, so in, 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 in the, sci the science fiction format where the, the, we use vampires as, as creatures, there was still a hierarchy in that they were a, we used them as a powerful race over a period of time. So they did have that overall power. And the other creatures, whether they were, they were uh, werewolves or whatever, they, they were subservient to them because of their overall power. Their, their longevity played into it. Uh, they were going to accumulate power over time, uh, dominion over, of, over mortals, no matter what the mortal was. So that's the kind of the way we played it in the sci-fi game. Um, so uh, last subject, and I think we're running up against time. We're getting close. Uh, the, 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 the trends right now, what do we think? Are we, are we still kind of following the trajectory of the twilight vampire are have we are we are we leaning back towards traditional vampires are we really exploring urban fantasy and putting vampires in in, in a modern setting where do we think the writing trend is today uh, and and i don't mean by volume i mean by let's say successful story well-written stories where do we think the vampire novels the do vampire stories are going today and i'll start with jonathan since he's our historical <laughs> well, I mean, I have no, I, I would say I have no clue, but I, I you know, I watch uh, What We Do in the Dark, Darkness, Dark, Darkness, I can't remember which one it is. That and, show is hilarious. Anybody that hasn't watched that show, that show is hilarious, so. And in some ways, that show uh, sort of shows us the, the way forward for vampires. This comedic, uh, you know, they're, they're not, you know, they're not as scary as they once were in, in some ways. They're... They're, because these are people who are out of their time. How, how often, you know, if you're 700 years old, how well can you fit into modern day America? And that show uh, really addresses that kind of thing. And it, it does a really good job at it. And so I think maybe that's the way forward. This, maybe the fish out of water vampire is the, is the way forward. There you go. Karen, what do you think? What the trend. Do I think? Where are we? <laughs> That vampires, if someone became a vampire now, that he would have a problem because the uh, target, the, the, their potential victims are so wrapped up in their telephones and their computers that a vampire would have no chance to recruit them. All you'd be able to do is sneak up behind them and take a bite. So if they really need, if they need human companionship, they're going to be SOL. But wow, yeah. From, I think from a social standpoint the, today, the yes. Wow. That the humans are going to be so self-absorbed that they're not going to interact with the vampires anymore. Oh. Very cool. Amy, what do you think? Well, I'll tell you, Amy, just a second. Let me hop the camera. Hey She's about to sign off. What do you, what do you, right, you go, you're going away, Tamara? All right, we'll talk yeah. to you later. All right. Amy, all right. what do you Hi, think? Tamara. Amy, so where do you think the vampire uh, fiction is going? O old school, new school, what do you think? Uh, the way I see it going is more of the modern day sort of tropes of where you have vampires, whether they're old or not, blending into the modern world. So you'll, ha or vampires being turned more recently and being basically, you know, human in high school turned into a vampire is still a human in high school. It's just now they have to deal with the vampire drama on top of that. So a lot of the stuff that I've read and uh, seen in TV shows, let's say the past 10 years or so, has been a lot more along those lines of, uh, or you have like the hundreds of year old vampires who just sort of like start a new life every 20 years or so. So they go back to human high school, they go to college, 
they are ha they have a career and then you know they figure they go start over somewhere else so people will go hey why do you never age um uh, and so I think I've been seeing a lot more of that. I think that's the way it's going, but I also can see where it would be like a really, I think a fun thing to do would be a clash between older vampires who are like, no, we're creatures of the night. We stick to tradition. And then you have like the new vampires who are like, I, I go to high school, dude. Like I've, I've got homework and the older vampires are going, yeah, but you're supposed to be a vampire. And he's like, I got blood from the blood bag. I don't need to go hunt. Go like, okay, boomer. Like I could, I, I, I could see that happening. And, and I think that plays into like, like you said, the blade thing, where where the old old school born vampires have been around hundreds of years. They've had this power base. They understand how everything's supposed to work. And then the uh, the the young vampire comes in. He wants clubs. He's gonna he's gonna grab that power. Uh, so he's he's the young hipster type, uh, ready to explore the modern world, raised in the modern world, interacting with young vampires in the modern world. And those old fogies don't have any idea. However, the real power base is with the old fogies who have accumulated that power, that wealth, that influence over time. So I think those two kind of uh, uh, can oppose each other, but it makes for a great storyline. The old guy knows everybody on the planet that could kill you in a heartbeat and knows who, how to pay them through uh, you know, old school stuff. So so he's got that that knowledge that then yeah. comes in and he just smacks down the young guy and goes, yeah, you may have a million followers, but you've got a stake in your heart now, smartass. So... <laughs> Again, yeah, my money's on the young guy. Like, I like. Let's see this. Let's pull off some vampires and do this because my money's gonna be on the young guy. Old and devious beats young and enthusiastic every time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks to our panel. It was a great panel. I, I had a great discussion here. I think everybody uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, thanks to Jonathan Baird, Karen, uh, Karen Bogan, and uh, Amy Adams. Thanks for our sorry, Amy uh, Adams, Amy Gibbons, Amy Gibbons, Amy Gibbons. Thank you. I actually uh, have some talent. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh, Tamara for joining us. And unfortunately, Terry had to drop out uh, with a, a connection issue. Uh, do you guys, anybody have any last uh, things they want to pitch out? Jonathan. Oh, um, you know, um, this book sometimes gets used in classes. So Wolf and Petticoats, if you really want to know, you know, if you like what I said tonight and want to know more about, you know, uh, vampires, werewolves in late Victorian uh, settings, this is a great book for you. Karen, what do you read what do you got? Book. Uh, read this book. It's blurry. I can't it's see it. What's the, title? What's the title, Karen? Uh, there you go. Uh, everything. It's in and out. Uh, almost there. I, 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 everything it's, works it's, in theory. Everything works in theory. Okay. And Amy, you have a, 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 some series out on vampires. Uh, yeah. So my main series is sort of like a cozy mystery paranormal romance. That is this one. So it's a lot more of like, let's say the fun vampires, the more human vampires. Uh, I actually do have a horror series out that I've started doing. It is more along the lines of some of the things they've been saying about uh, sort of like some of the old school vampires. So mine is very uh, demon based. So it's the same idea. It's um, definitely me going for more horror and it's me basing it as much in real life as I can. So it's very much based on the Catholic idea of demons and that sort of, this could be real kind of fear. So I have cool. both of those. And both I do, uh, I, I pulled my vampires into science fiction. It's uh, werewolves, aliens, ninjas. Uh, vampires are aliens as well. Uh, we have gray aliens fighting. We The, the werewolves are a species. Uh, it's kind of a space opera meets urban fantasy uh adventure so anyways fun read uh working on book number two with my son so thanks for everybody thanks to liberty con for letting us talk and uh hopefully uh we'll be able to tune in and talk to the uh, fans when this broadcast bye bye folks bye bye bye